Good evening to you all. This is the first of uh, a number of Christmas and New Year messages that I intend to send out entitled Blessings from the Boat. This message this evening is dedicated primarily to my friends and relatives in the city of Cork. In October last, I attended and preached at the funeral service of my Fermanagh cousin, Donald Spence. It was Donald's father in 1970 that led me to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He took me into his home and he mentored me and he helped me and for that, and Pat as well, and for that we are eternally grateful. To Donald's son, Alan, and his wife, Janet, to Donald's daughters, Donna, Lisa, Laura, and his ex-wife, Norma, and all others who received me so graciously over those three days and so kindly, I send forth this gospel message and will be remembering you in my prayers on this first Christmas and New Year without your dad. Just one verse of scripture is in Luke's Gospel 2 and verse 7. And it says about Mary, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Isn't it sad that millions of Christians worldwide remember and celebrate the birth of Christ yearly and yet only a small proportion of them remember his death weekly. Nowhere in the scriptures by the Lord Jesus Christ himself or the apostles or prophets or anybody else, nowhere we are told to remember his birth. But he commands us and others encourage us, uh, uh, encourages us and instructs us to remember his death weekly by the breaking of bread and the drinking of the communion wine. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me on the first day of the week. My mother used to say to me, how is it that you do what you're not told to do and you don't do what you are told to do? Well, I didn't know the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, or I would have quoted them to her. Paul says, for the good that I would, I do not and the evil which I would, that I do. While we're not told to remember the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are scores of scripture in the Old Testament and New Testament to tell us about when he was born, where he was born, how he was born, and why he was born. And why he was born is the most probably important question of all, and there are three reasons scripturally that Jesus Christ came and was born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. The first one is the most obvious one, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and we are all sinners and have all come short of the glory of God. The second reason was that he said, I come to do my Father's will, and the Father's will for him was the cross of Calvary who would die and rise again for his sins. All these had to do with coming, had to do with his death. And the third one was, John tells us in one of his epistles, he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And there at the cross, he cried, finished, glory to God, and destroyed the devil's works. And he has that to finish yet, which he will do. Probably, probably the best known of scriptures literally and actually regarding his birth is this Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, which we, we have just read together. And in this verse, you see that the, it says, and she brought forth her firstborn son. That tells us that he was a son. You know, uh, Mary had six other children to Joseph, but he was the only one, of course, was born of the virgin. There were nine people in that house and it was apparently a very small house where Jesus was born because you're going to see in a moment he was born in poverty. 
Someone said it was no wonder that he had to go out onto the mountain to pray. Don't you make excuses for prayer. You'll always find a place to pray if you want to pray. But here it tells us that he was the firstborn, he was the firstborn son. Now, he was the son of God. Away 700 years before that, Isaiah tells us, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Here we have the child born, but here we have the son mentioned as well. You see, he was God the son and the son of God. He was God manifest in flesh. And if you, de- if you don't believe that, then you're in great trouble when it comes to the gospel. I had the Jehovah Witnesses called at my door not so long ago. You watch them. They're a very dangerous crowd. And they came to my door lately, and the young man, about 22 years of age, and another young man, well-dressed, he said to me, we are Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, very good. Jehovah Yahweh, the God of Abram and Isaac and of Jacob and the God of Israel. That's right, you know something, he said. And I said, God had one son and he sent him to this world. That's right. God had one son and he died on the cross of Calvary. That's right. And he rose again. That's right. Every time they nodded the head. And he's coming back again. That's right. But I said, here's where you and I differ. And here's where you and I are going to part company today. He was the son of God. He was God the son. He was part of the Trinity. And he shook his head and he said, no. Well, I said, be gone. And he nodded his head and the way he went. I tell you, my friend, if Jesus Christ was just a man created as they say he was, then he was no use to me the night that I come under conviction of sin. He was no good to me the night that I walked the shores and on, on the banks of the lower Loch Air and tormented with my past. He was no good to me. I needed someone who could do something and could rescue me and lift me and give me peace with God and sins forgiven. I could have went to the Methodist minister in Churchill. I don't know what he would have told me. I could have went to the Roman Catholic priest in Derogonley. He would have probably pointed me to Mary, but your Mary needed a savior herself. Mary said, God, my savior, and she needed a savior. Mary was a good preacher, you know. Mary said to them at the wedding of Cana, uh, said to the crowd there, she said, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. What does he say? He says, you must be born again. Mary was a good preacher. And I don't know that there'd be no use in me going to the priest and there'd be no use in me going to uh, the Methodist minister and there'd be no use in me going to the Cooneyites who my father associated with because they would have told me just walk a good life and all would be well, but that's no use. But I went to a man who pointed me to a man. I went to a man who told me and gave me this verse of Scripture, that mighty verse of Scripture, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. Here's now, God's Son, God's Son, cleanseth me from all sin. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the Son of God. He was born of the virgin. He was without sin. I needed somebody who was sinless, somebody who was perfect. A sinless, a sinful man can't take away the sin of another man. So I came to Jesus because he was the Son of God. The Son of God loved me. My friend, that ever boggles me. I ever gripped that mighty text where Paul says, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. It's one thing that he loved the world. There's another thing that he loved the church and gave himself for the church, but he loved me, a sinner, a fool like me. He loved me and gave himself on Calvary's cross for me. What a mighty truth. What a mighty truth that is. That Jesus Christ died for the ungodly and Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Let me leave you with a couple of short things from this seasonal text in verse 7. It says, Mary and she brought forth her firstborn. Now, we're told that Mary was about 17 or 18 years of age. As we would say, she was just a a slip of a girl. She was a virgin. 
who carried the child for nine months because it says here she's going to bring forth. The fullness of time had come. They traveled about 90 miles on and off horseback or a, a donkey and came the whole way here to Bethlehem. Now, the first thing that I want to say about this very simply this to you today is he was visualized before he was born. He was visualized before he was born. It's very hard to hide a pregnancy. In the village of Nazareth, everybody knew one another. They were married through one another. For months they would have known that Mary was pregnant and she wasn't married. That would have set the tongues waggling in those days, you know, adultery. Uh, the law for adultery was being stoned to death. Let me spiritualize this a little for you and apply it a little to you that are listening to me this evening. Don't you think, don't you know, mothers especially, don't you think, don't you know very well that there was a child in her womb? She could feel him. She knew it. She showed it. And can I say to you that profess to be a Christian, that have professed and asked the Lord Jesus into your heart. Do you know, can you say without a doubt, like Job of old, I know that my Redeemer liveth. There's no supposition now when it comes to this. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Can you say that from your heart? Can you say like Paul, Christ in me, the hope of glory? Can you say that? I tell you that every night that this woman, Mary, went to bed, she knew it. Every morning when she rose, she knew it. Every day she walked through the streets in the town, she knew it. Every step that she took, every time she sat down, and every time she got up, she knew that there was something different in her life. If Christ is in us, the hope of glory, if he's in you, if he's in me, we will know it. We will know of sins forgiven. We will know of peace with God. We will know of assurance of heaven. But my friend, the thing is this. Not only will we know it, but we will show it. People will notice it. People will see it. People will say, there's a change in that man. There's a change in that woman. Ivan Thompson, who used to preach for us long ago, used to say, if there's no change, there's something strange. You have asked the Lord into your heart. You profess to be a Christian. Is there any change? Is there any change in your life? Do you, do, do, do you know it? And you say, yes, I know it. Do, do you show it? Do you show it? Does other people know it? Does other people see it? Does your wife know it? Does your husband know it? Do your children know it? Do they know it at work? Do they know it on the farm? Do they know it in the office? Do they know it in the factory? Do they know there's something different about this man? There's, there's, there's a change in this man's life. There's a change. Because if there's no change, you need to go around and examine yourself. The evident, uh, it's evident without a question if there's a work done in the life that it will be obvious to others around it. Because the Bible says we're a new creation. Old things have passed away. My friend, the night that, that morning that Billy Spence led me to the Lord, I knew it. I didn't feel much different at the time. I didn't know very little or nothing. You know, I never knew a Bible verse until I was 25 years of age. And some of you young people are brought up and nurtured in the gospel and you're still not saved. But I knew there was something different. I knew there was a change. I knew that old things had passed away. I lost the desire for the drink. I lost the desire for the gambling. I lost the desire for the dirty joke. I was cleansed. I was a new creature, born again by the Spirit of God. Mighty work of the gospel all through. The babe, I was born in Bethlehem manger. There's three things about a woman who's pregnant. The first thing is this, she'll talk about it. She'll talk about it. It'll be their conversation to other women. It'll be the conversation almost day and night. She'll be talking about the child. 
Uh, there'll be a change in her talk. There'll be a change in her walk. If you walk, you'll know it. There'll be a change in her diet. Nutriments will have to be changed and added and different things along those lines. And she will know it. And we should know it by our talk. We should know it by our walk. And we should know it by our diet, which is the word of God. And feeding ourselves on the bread, on the manna of life. So the first thing I say about this is, she, he was visualized before he was born. The second thing is this from this text, he was poverized. I tell you he was born in a filthy cattle shed. And she wrapped him in bandages in torn bandages, strips of cloth. And I don't want to be too personal on this, but the women use these certain times of the month. You can see how poverized that he was. You could see that he was born not in a manger, really, but it means uh, he was born in a feeding trough. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. We sing those songs. We sing away in a manger. It wouldn't. It would be too polite. To, wouldn't be polite enough to sing away in a feeding truck. But he was born in a feeding truck. He was poor, poor, poor parents, poverty. Paul says about him in this. In Ephesians, he says, though he was rich, yet for our sakes, for my sake, he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. When was he rich? Ah, oh, my dear friends, listen, he wasn't rich when he was down here. He slept in another's manger. He fished in another's boat. He borrowed another's penny. He rode in another's donkey. And he was buried in another's tomb. He was born in poverty. He lived in poverty. He said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. When he died, they stripped him. When they were crucifying them, they stripped him of his garments. They didn't even leave him with a vestige of a garment. And when you see a photograph of Christ, uh, 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 an idolatry picture of Christ up on the wall with a garment covering his middle parts, it's a lie because he was stripped naked. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. That was part of the shame. The creator, the eternal son of the eternal God, the creator, sustainer, provider of all things, became a baby, a span's length and a manger, we fingers, and he had fingers and he had a face and he had a head so that they could crown him with thorns and he had a back that they could lash him and had hands that they could nail him to the cross. This is the son of God who died on Calvary's cross. I tell you, he was rich in grace. Uh, he was rich in so many things, but he wasn't rich in, the, in this world's goods that men are fighting and falling out for and gathering together for, to leave behind. Uh, I tell you, his grace is unmeasurable. His love is unfathomable. His joy is unspeakable. His life is unending. His nature is unchanging. He's the all-changing one. Hallelujah. He can change the worst of sinners. He is the non-changing one. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the ex-changing one. He took my place and died for me. So the first thing we see, he was visualized. Secondly, we think he was pauperized. And lastly, he was ostracized. It says she laid him and she laid him. There's no midwife. She laid him in a manger. And there is this wee word, because. Because there was no room for them. And you put a ring around the word them. Because the devil wasn't after Mary and Joseph. The devil was after him. And we know that when we read on when Herod tried to kill the boys. Or did kill the boys in, in Bethlehem. And so, it was them, it was him that they were after. There was no room for him in the inn. John the Beloved said later, he said he came unto his own and his own received him not. 
But as many as received him, to them give ye the privilege to be the sons of God. Receive him, receive him into your heart and into your life as your Savior today. They didn't want him in the town of Bethlehem. They don't want them in the towns tonight. They want the carousal, they want the drink, they want the crackers, they want the Christmas tree, but they don't want Christ. They didn't want them in the town, they didn't want them in the country when he preached his first sermon in Nazareth. They laid hold of him and tried to fire him out over the brow of the city. They don't want them, they don't want them in the country. When they went over to the Gadara there and they sat the Gadara, gathering free, the pig farmers prayed that he might leave. Oh, farmer, farmer, listening to me tonight, do you want him? They prayed that he might leave because he damaged their business. God loves you tonight, and we know the story of the rich farmer, sir, where he says, this, God said, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. It says that the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He was rich before that, that crop came. He was already rich. To be rich on the farm, you need to be able to work. To be able to work, you need health and strength, and God has been good to you, farmers. And yet, there's another year come, coming to an end, and the harvest passed, and the summer's ended. And you're not yet saved. Oh, may you cry on the Son of God tonight. They didn't want him in the town. They didn't want him in the country. They didn't want him in the city. The only one place they wanted him. And that was on that old rugged cross, stripped naked, crowned with thorns, his back lashed. There they wanted him. And there they put him. And there they nailed him. Oh, my friend, what a message of the gospel. You know, we'll hear so much about the innkeeper in the days that lie ahead. And people will talk about his cruelty and his selfishness and his despicableness that he, he, he turned the Savior away. Well, I don't think he knew what he was doing. And if you rejected Lord Jesus Christ today, you don't know what you're doing. The God of this world has blinded your mind. Because don't you blame the innkeeper and don't you laugh and talk about the innkeeper and they'll write hymns and we'll sing poems and we'll play cards and all about the hotelier who wouldn't let Jesus in. But what about you? As I finish, what about you? Revelation 3 and verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock of any man. If any man, any woman will open the door, I will come in. It's supper time, it's late, and sup with him, and he with me. My friend, don't you mock the innkeeper. What about you? He's at your door. He's at your heart's door. He says, if the prerogative is yours, if, if you will open the door and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, come into my heart and save me from my sin, he'll do it. If, 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 if you open the door, he's waiting on you. The prerogative, if, if, any man, that's the people. I don't care how bad you are tonight, I don't, today. I don't care how drunk, drunk you are. I don't care what you've done in your past life. I don't care how evil you've been. I don't care what part of the country you come from, whether you're rich or poor. My friend, the Christ died for sinners. He died for all. He came into the world to save all. The people, if any man, any woman, there's a prerogative if. There's a people if. Any man, there's a plea. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That word I'm told in the Greek is a continual knocking. That's not the first time he knocked. It's a continual. Do you hear him knocking? Have you heard him knocking? Is he knocking on you again tonight in your heart? He says, let me in, let me in, and you'll shut the door and don't let him in. Go to hell. No other place. No other way. Yeah, but there's the promise. He says, I will come in and sup with him. My friend, that's the supper time. It's the last meal, the Eastern meal of the day. And when we come to supper time, it's late. I tell you, my friend, it's later than we could ever believe. The world is in a mess tonight. It's going about like a drunken man. Look at the Middle East. Look at the signs and all around us that the evil and the wickedness that Jesus Christ is coming back again. It's late. It's supper time. 
In the next couple of verses, we read that the church is taken out and we're going to be lifted out. We're going to be raptured out some of these days. Be ye also ready, for you know not the day or the hour that the Son of Man cometh. Oh, if only I could put my arms around you tonight and bring you to the Savior that saved me those 52 years ago, made life worth living, death worth dying, eternity worth looking for. This is the message of the gospel. This is the message of joy and peace. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and Mary wrapped him, put him in torn bandages, laid him in the manger. And that little baby became the son of God, was the son of God, was the gift given for mankind that whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Acts 4 and 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven. Here's now given. It's a gift. You don't have to pay for it. Just receive him by faith and have your sins forgiven and peace with God. May God bless you down in Cork. May God bless you across wherever you are that listen to this message. And may Christmas be a real Christmas and not a Christmas without Christ. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen.